So you probably recognize me. My compatriot Matt is behind the camera. My name is Michael, obviously, and we're doing another build today. This time we're looking to build a media server. Now, if you didn't catch it last time, you can click this link over here where we built our custom gaming rig and editing system. But today we are specifically focusing on a media server that's going to pump out videos and just about anything else you want to several devices simultaneously with all hope. It's really up to the software there, but the system will do it. Now, we're starting with a pretty simple case. This is an, by a company called A1. It's an A1104, I believe. There's several variants on this. They're all exactly the same. They come with a 450 watt power supply built in and they're pretty cheap. And for a server, that's all you really want. You don't need anything flashy. You don't need bright lights. You want to tuck it in the corner and hope no one notices. All right, so to go with this, I've already put the pegs in here that are going to mount the motherboard. I thought I would take a little bit of time out to make sure we didn't sit there fiddling with things unnecessarily. Now over here, this is a micro ATX system I should mention. It's small form factor. We're not going with a big rig. We're not going with a tower. So we're using a Gigabyte H81M2, sorry, uh, S2PH motherboard. Now it's nothing flash, but when paired with our CPU over here, which isn't again, anything particularly flash, we're using an Intel, goodness, what is it? An Intel G4320. Uh, it's quad core 3.2 gigahertz, I think. Is that right, Matt? 3.2 gigahertz? Now, in conjunction with each other, it'll happily pump out 4K resolution video without stuttering. And given how little we're paying for the components, we're pretty happy with this. And you really shouldn't have any problems if you're going to build a system like this. So first things first, we've got to put the backing plate on for the motherboard. Work out which way is up. That looks kind of right. Now, backing plates can be a bit finicky. Make sure it really pops in there. Come on. That's in nice and tight. Now, it's worth mentioning that with the particular case that we're using, there are no instructions at all. So if you don't have the foggiest of what you're doing, well, you might have a bit of trouble. Like with cables that don't want to stay where you want them. Forget it. It doesn't matter. It'll behave itself eventually. Impressively, this is the moment where you really take into appreciation just how tiny a micro ATX motherboard is. <laughs> I have never used a board this small in my life. It's almost cute. Almost. All right, so we're just going to stick the screws in. Everything's lining up beautifully today, which is always nice when things work exactly the way they're meant to. The motherboard is really quite small. As you can see, it barely takes up any room in this case whatsoever. Now, we covered this last time that you can go horribly wrong installing a graphic uh, CPU, but as long as you follow the connections and you don't question it, there are telltale signs on every CPU you get. And usually you can't see it very well, but there's a little notch down here and over here and you need to match it up with a plastic guard. If you go against that guard, you will break something. Well, in this case, not very expensive, but on a proper rig, you're gonna break something quite important. So he'll sit happily in there. Then we shall pin that under, push down and latch. And he's in snug as a bug. Now, there's some questions online as to whether you should be using stock heat sinks and fans. If you're not overclocking the system, if you're not pushing it, you don't need to buy an expensive heat sink or fan. There are some beautiful ones out there, but for anything basic, you don't need to do it. If you're pushing the system, if you're overclocking it, if it's running at in excess of 80 degrees Celsius, you'd probably want to consider a better heat sink or water cooling. But if you're just using it as a media center or a basic desktop or something that's not overclocked, don't waste your money. All 
It also might be mentioning that because this is a really basic system, we're using reasonably low-end equipment. It's very, very um, heat appropriate. It doesn't generate much heat. There's nothing fancy going in here. We don't even have a graphics card because ultimately we don't need it. For the purpose of a media server, this will more than do everything we need without a graphics card. So the case doesn't come with any fans in it, and that's going to be fine for us. We shouldn't have any problems with that. Uh, ultimately, the power supply has a massive fan built into the base. Any heat that rises up is going to get sucked into there and pushed out the back of the system, and it's got more than the ventilation on the side, so we won't have problems with airflow realistically. So we're also going with reasonably basic RAM here, just some Patriot Signature Series. Reasonably cheap, all things considered. And we're going with 8 gig, just because we want to make sure we've got plenty of uh, RAM to go around for the applications and whatnot that we're running here. Unlike our last build, this motherboard only has two slots for RAM, so you're not going to be able to get confused when you install these. And that's in. This is probably the easiest build I've ever done in my life. So we've got two three terabyte Toshiba hard drives here. And for temporary purposes, we're gonna drop a DVD drive in just to install Windows. Um, we're gonna take that out in the end. We don't actually want a DVD drive in here. It is just a remote media server on the network and there's no need for the DVD drive, all things considered. So. That is just going to be a temporary install. Now, just while we're doing this, it might be worth mentioning that when we originally planned out to build this system, we were originally looking at AMD components. And at the end of the day, we're looking at the idea of future proofing. So price-wise, we went with this particular Intel processor purely because it was quad-core, it had more means to it, it had more grunt, and we'd like to do more with it than just media serve at the end of the day. We're actually going to be building a second one of these that we're going to be using to host a Minecraft server, so we needed a bit of extra grunt. Now, I haven't plugged everything in just yet. There's still a lot of cables here, and we've got to tidy some of this up. But you might notice down here we have some SATA ports. Now, check with your manual, find out what ports or what numbers. The zero port you want for your primary hard drive. For us, it's this white one over here, closest to the back of the board. Kind of, if you will. So that's going to go into our first drive. The second one we're going to temporarily connect to the DVD drive so that we can install the operating system once we're done with that. We're going to swap it down to the second drive, and that's mostly just our storage and everything else. So, we can close this guy up and we can get around to installing the operating system. And then, we can get onto our service software. We didn't cover something reasonably important when it came to the power supply and our motherboard. The motherboard has an 8-port connector for the ATX power that runs everything on the board, and the power supply only has a 4-port or 4-prong uh, power adapter. That's not a problem, it still works. You'll find it'll only fit in one way, and that will more than do the job. It's not a problem, you can leave the other ones unfilled, it's never going to be an issue. It'll work. We promise you. More so, we didn't take into account then we tried to install Windows 8 onto a 3 terabyte drive. We'd never done this before. I run SSDs, they're never big. Windows 8 doesn't like that. It only lets you use 2.2 terabytes of the available hard drive for the installation and the other 750 gets discarded as unusable space. So don't install Windows 8 to a 3 terabyte drive if you can avoid it. Apparently you can get around this by using a GDB, a GTP, was it Matt? He's kind of looking at me like I've got three heads right now. There is a setting for the partitioning that will allow you to do that. If you can avoid it, put Windows on a smaller operating, on a smaller drive. That way, in the event of a critical error, it's only your small Windows drive that's going to go down, not all your data. And especially given this is a media server, we don't want to lose all that stuff. Now, 
The fun part is obviously the fact that we've got the Plex server running. Now we've chosen Plex purely for the fact that it's easy to do, it takes the metadata from all your files, it populates it all, and we're going to show that off over here. All right, so we've got Plex running on the server at the moment, and we've got it hooked up to a couple of devices right now using the app. Now we just want to explain how simple this is. Once you've got the basic metadata, which honestly, Plex will do most of the work for you. In literally, I mean, we've got a series of shows here. We'll pick one to start, pick a season, pick an episode, hit play. So we're set on this, but that's not all. We're not restricted to playing to just one device. Loading shows, pick a season, an series and an episode and bang now we've got two playing but we've got more than that if you've got a smart enabled TV there's a good chance you can get Plex running on your TV as well so now we're running three devices and we're not restricted to that if you've got a web browser basically anything on your home network of a web browser can access the Plex through the IP address and you can stream to everything you're not restricted to just things that have application running. And really, it's as simple as that. So, till next time.